Hello, my name is Dr. Nitin Tandon. I'm a professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at UT Health and the director of the Epilepsy Surgery Program at Memorial Hermann Hospital in the Texas Medical Center. I'm um, speaking today about a new technology that we've been using uh, over the past several years here uh, at the Texas Comprehensive Epilepsy Program to treat certain types of epilepsies, a technology that does not require a big open operation but instead uses modern techniques of placing a small fiber inside the brain to then deliver laser energy and heat to destroy the seizure focus without the invasiveness of traditional brain operations. So in a previous webinar, we talked about SEEG, and which is stereoelectroencephalography, which is a minimally invasive technique for localizing seizures. And we left towards the end of that webinar uh, this aspect of what happens after stereoelectroencephalography. We hinted there about this possibility of using minimally invasive ablation techniques coupled to the minimally invasive localization techniques. And this is the thrust of this webinar. And this is stated differently here, that minimally invasive surgical approaches for epilepsy couple stereo EEG with laser ablation of a seizure focus. Now this is how laser ablation works. There is a small incision made in the patient's skin. The planning of the incision and the planning of the trajectory through which this laser fiber will be placed is done with great care. And we usually use a stereotactic frame or a stereotactic robot to place the probe. The incision is very small. This little anchor bolt is placed in the skin through this laser applicator sheath, which is 1.65 millimeters in diameter, a, um, a, a very small, very thin uh, laser diffuser is passed along with the cooling catheter. Uh, after the placement of this apparatus uh, uh, to the target, we go to the MRI scanner and in the MRI scanner, we perform real-time mapping of temperature changes in the brain during the application of the laser energy. And this allows us then to predict which parts of the brain are being destroyed by the heat energy and also allows us to watch in real time which areas are being preserved or saved or not being damaged. This technology is called MRI Guided Laser Interstitial Thermal Therapy, or Visualase for short. Um, it is um, used for epilepsy as well as for brain tumors. It's been around with us, and we've been using it for just under four years at this point, and I want to share with you some of our experiences. So here is uh, a schematic of how the laser fiber is passed to the target. In this case, the target is shown in yellow. The patient is then taken to the MRI scanner where the heat energy is applied. This is a little movie to show you that once the probe is in place, we do this real-time thermal imaging, which on the left-hand side is the updated uh, minute, uh, second by second. Uh, on the left-hand side is the updated uh, second by second heat map. And on the right, is the conjoined heat maps integrated over time to come up with a damage estimate of which parts of the brain have actually been destroyed by the heat energy. Um, this process of ablation lasts several minutes, maybe even up to half an hour. And right after we finish the ablation, we obtain another kind of an MRI scan that confirms the area of damage uh, by giving the patient a small dose of contrast um, agent that outlines the area of damage um, in three dimensions. This is just a little schematic also to illustrate that if you stay below a certain temperature, there is minimal, if any, thermal damage below 43 degrees centigrade. And then between 44 and 59 degrees is time-dependent thermal damage. So this is really the area that we really want to be in. And if we go much higher than that, the damage is really instantaneous. And so we regulate the output and the laser combined with the cooling 
around the laser fiber to reach a happy zone where we can watch the ablation happening in a very controllable fashion. And uh, there is a older technology called radio frequency lesioning that has been around for many decades that some people have used in the past for seizures as well. The problem with radio frequency, which is really you know, electrical um, damage of the, of the tissue, is that it does not follow the boundaries that we would like it to follow. It also creates a zone of uncertainty where tissues are damaged but not destroyed. And then probably the most importantly, we can't do real-time monitoring of uh, RF lesioning while we can do real-time monitoring of uh, laser ablation, which gives us both the ability to create a larger lesion as well as a safer lesion. There are various ways by which the laser applicators can be placed. These include stereotactic arms, such as made by Brain Lab or Medtronic. Um, they can use a uh, navigated cannulated drill guide. And um, the most common and most widely used technology is the stereotactic frame, which is either the Lexel or the CRW frame. Um, this is an illustration of us placing a Lexel stereotactic frame. This is an apparatus that gets attached to the patient's head. Uh, there are little um, markers on the sides of the frame that allow us to then take an x-ray to confirm that our laser probe, which is this line here, right, right, right in the center of this little circle and this little square, which confirms precise placement. Once the probe is placed, uh, the patient is then taken to the MRI scanner. We have also been placing these probes now with our serotactic robot, uh, the ROSA robot, which allows us to do this much faster with great precision and with a much wider choice of trajectories of placement of these laser probes. Remember this ROSA robot was the same robot that we used for placement of the SEEG electrodes um, in, the in the prior webinar. I'm going to talk now about a couple of illustrative cases that show when and how we use this approach. Uh, the first case was a 52-year-old chemist, uh, gainfully employed, doing very well professionally, except that he had seizures, not infrequently. These seizures had were complex partial seizures. He would blank out, stare, become unresponsive, and then get back to his normal uh, functional state. He has no history of having grand mal seizures. His verbal IQ and performance IQ, as you can see, is very bright. Um, and he was concerned about his memory or his language skills worsening after a traditional temporal lobe operation. And so he declined having that and came to us from out of state for a laser ablation procedure. His MRI scan is shown here. These are coronal views of his MRI scan. The left temporal lobe is on this side, the right is on this side. And as you can see, there is left hippocampal volume loss, more noticeable on this sequence. If you compare, this is the healthy right hippocampus, the smaller and scarred left hippocampus. You can see this here as well, right hippocampus and left hippocampus. So after a long discussion, we decided that we would proceed with laser ablation. <clears throat> this was the placement of the laser applicator sheath. This is a placement from the occipital region of the brain along the long axis of the hippocampus into the amygdala. So our goals are to get into the amygdala and the hippocampus and part of the parahippocampal gyrus uh, without damaging anything else. This is the same um, same probe in a different view. This is actually the left side of the patient's brain. This image is flipped over. Um, and now here is the real-time ablation map. So this is the delivery of energy or heat to first the amygdala, and then we pull the probe back and deliver the same energy towards the head of the hippocampus and further back into the body of the hippocampus and then more towards the tail of the hippocampus. And as this is all completed, 
this is the last ablation on the back end of the hippocampus. We then obtain a post-ablation contrasted MRI scan, which shows the zone of ablation here. And here is a verification of this is the heat damage estimate, and here's the ablation. As you can see, interestingly, the ablation zone follows the contour of the hippocampus, which is a curved structure and respects the normal tissue boundaries, which allows us to do very selective damage to this brain area. So this patient is now almost three years out. He's seizure-free, has had no subjective, cognitive, or memory complaints, really no changes in his neuropsychological profile. And here is his MRI that was obtained about six months post-op. As you can see, the little shriveled hippocampus that he had is now gone, there's a little target that delineates where the ablation was. Our next patient is a little more complex. It's a 32-year-old right-handed lady whose seizure started about 10 years before she came to us. She has an aura or a warning of a warm or a heat sensation, followed then by a sense of visual distortion where things appear to be spinning. And this is then followed by loss of awareness and confusion a so-called complex partial seizure. On her phase one recordings or a scalp recordings, she had um, right posterior temporal spikes and a right temporal onset to her seizures. Her imaging studies showed abnormalities in how the brain was formed, a periventricular nodular heterotopia, a polymicrogyria, these acronyms PVNH and PMG uh, are developmental abnormalities in her right parietal lobe and in the intraparietal sulcus. And she also had a schizencephalic fissure, uh, which is also a malformation of brain development, all in that right part of the brain. Despite all of this, she's highly functioning. She is gainfully employed and is very artistic and um, came to us uh, for surgical consideration. Here is her having a seizure recorded in our epilepsy unit. She's looking at something on a computer, and at some point, she just becomes unresponsive and is unable to process what is happening. Able to speak. So as you can see, she has a complex partial seizure, unable to speak, unable to comprehend, unable to follow commands, and um, uh, and this continues for quite some period of time. So this is a scalp recordings where you see that she has right temporal discharges. This is her seizure onset, which suggests a right temporal onset and propagation of her seizures. Um, this is the propagation part, a little clearer here, where you see a right temporal ictal pattern. Uh, and then this is followed then by progression towards generalization, all from the right temporal lobe. Uh, here's the complex part of her case, is her lesion or imaging. She has periventricular nodular heterotopia, is a fancy name really for a developmental abnormality in the brain. Turns out that the brain develops really from the inside out. We start life as a, our brain starts life as a hollow tube and this hollow tube then becomes in the adult, the ventricle, and brain cells start on the inside of the ventricle and move to the outside. And it happens many, many times until you have 
all of your cortex uh, and all of the sulci and gyri of the cortex form. Now, for some reason in some people during uh, their developmental stage when they're still really inside a mom or in very few early weeks of life, this migrational process that should have occurred um, while, uh, while they were still being formed doesn't happen correctly. And these neurons or brain cells instead accumulate around the ventricle. We call this term periventricular nodular heterotopia. In addition to this, she also has an abnormality in the cortex here. As you can see on this side, this part of the brain looks normal with normal folding pattern, and this does not. This is also seen differently in coronal slices of the brain where you can see a large cleft in the brain. This is the schizencephalic cleft along with polymicrogyria outlining it. So using this information, uh, we then implanted her with electrodes. This is a little movie to show you the SEEG electrode placement in her case. Um, those are all the scalp fiducials or skull fiducials and here are all the electrodes that go into deep parts of the brain, including sampling from that polymicrogyria and the periventricular nodular heterotopia. It is important to point out that this would be an impossible evaluation to perform without having an SEEG-like technique to sample multiple different deep areas of the brain. These are her seizure onsets, which were really involving part of her polymicrogyria and the, the uh, nodule, the periventricular nodule. So it's pretty broad onset involving many channels, but always consistent and always synchronized the same way. This is the evolution. And a problem that we have, and I'm going to go back really quick to her MRI scan, is that we now know that these parts of the brain, these deep parts of the brain, abnormal tissues are making the seizures, this area here and this area here. But we also know that the area just behind this and connected to the white matter in front of this is responsible for vision. And as we said, she's artistic. She likes to create lots of artwork professionally. And, uh, and she also wants to drive. So she requested that we try to do whatever possible to minimize the effect of our epilepsy operation on her ability to drive and to see well. And therefore, we came up with an idea of doing laser ablation instead of a traditional resection. A traditional resection here would involve removing all of this abnormal tissue and sacrificing vision. Um, so we then placed two laser applicators into this area of periventricular nodular heterotopia and through the polymicrogyria, and then did ablation of both of these regions, the, the periventricular nodular heterotopia as well as the polymicrogyria, using serial ablations along the length of these catheters. And here's the final damage map. So you see now there's an area of ablation of the nodule. Here is the area of ablation of the polymicrogyria. The visual fibers we expect to be traveling in this region right below this and therefore should be spared or mostly spared by the resection or by the ablation. And this is how we did. This is the visual fields afterwards. We didn't completely save all the vision, but we saved lots of useful vision and she essentially ended up with less than a quadrant or less than one quarter of her visual fields being affected. And this did not compromise her ability to drive or to function in any way. So we have uh, published on this approach of using laser ablation of periventricular nodular heterotopia. And we're compiling additional experiences so that we can inform the broader medical community about this innovative approach to dealing with these difficult lesions. To also summarize our experience with combining 
stereo EEG to localize epilepsy with laser ablation. We've done that now in 16 patients, as you can see here, the intersection of these two graphs. Um, 12 patients had just SEEG and laser ablation, and four had SEEG and laser ablation combined with the resection. And this is only of the patients that we have at least six months follow-up on. And this is uh, the outcome in those patients uh, that we have treated this way. Uh, the smaller this number, the better the outcome. And I'm going to draw your attention to this score here, which shows a number one in more than half of these patients. And remember that many of these patients are really hard to localize, are really difficult to identify the seizure focus on. Um, so to summarize, you know, we feel that non-lesional and such difficult lesions are best and ideally localized with minimally invasive SEG techniques. And in many of these cases, we can follow up with laser ablation. Of course, there are also other cases where laser ablation is done, like the first case that I showed you, without implantation of electrodes. And that leads to a great outcome with minimal effect on cognitive functions in many cases. Again, to emphasize, this is really a team sport. Uh, we work closely together, our neurologists and us, to come up with an individualized and optimized treatment plan for each patient. We spend literally hours on each patient's decision-making to make certain that we've all thought through each aspect of their epilepsy as closely as possible so that we can deliver the best and state-of-the-art care to help them uh, function normally, both from a medical standpoint as well as socially. And this is the team. Um, I'd like to thank all of them for their contributions over the years to our program. Thank you.